this edition of Sightings. 20 years ago, the Iranian Air Force went to war with an extraterrestrial enemy. I was going to prepare myself to sh shoot it down. And I heard nothing from the pilots, so I was so scared. A Sightings exclusive reveals that the United States government may have helped cover up this air battle with an alien force. Then, an update to our Heartland ghost investigation continues. He's going to try to attack me. I won't tolerate that. I'm not afraid of you. Renowned psychic Peter James encounters bizarre ghostly activity. Later, there's a serial murderer stalking the Nevada desert, and this woman is helping the police track the killer. He does pose as either a security guard or a policeman. He does not pose as a trucker that he may be. Plus, a miraculous story of animals healing humans. When he saw the animal, it was just like totally different. It was like tears of joy. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. Now, Sightings goes inside Iran and uncovers the truth about a mass UFO encounter in 1976. You will hear from an Imperial Iranian Air Force general, a pilot, and an air traffic controller who have remained silent for more than 15 years. And you will actually see those people play themselves in a unique documentary. At the beginning, we thought the Iraqi are coming. All of a sudden, I see this flying object just going round and round and round and going up and up and up. And I told my mom, I said, Mom, I just saw a flying saucer. I saw a UFO. I was going to prepare myself to, to sh shoot it down. It was seen by civilians, pilots, generals, and the unerring eye of Air Force radar. Reports ricocheted from the Shah to President Ford and back again. The film that you're watching recreates the day's events with the actual military personnel who witnessed the most compelling UFO encounter sightings has ever investigated. This film, seen here for the first time outside of Iran, was produced by the government and in a bizarre twist of fate would one day be used by the Ayatollah Khomeini to discredit the Shah. When I saw this object, is flying that fast, then I thought this is not a helicopter and this is not an aircraft. By that time, I said, oh, should be some kind of a UFO. Radar readings taken inside the control tower at Mirabad Air Force Base indicated the object was at least as large as a Boeing 707 tanker. The situation was serious. Brigadier General Nader Yousefi, base operations commander and the number three man in the Iranian Air Force, was notified immediately. So I picked up the phone and it was a base commander he wanted me to know they are going to have the airplanes to take off from his base for the scrambled mission. General Yousefi authorized an immediate scramble mission. An Iranian Air Force F-4 Phantom jet fighter was ordered to engage the UFO and determine what it was. The F-4 approached Mach 1 in its pursuit of the UFO. At an altitude of 23,000 feet, the lead pilot reported in that he clearly saw a brilliant object 75 miles ahead of him. His actual radio transmissions are heard here publicly for the first time outside Iran. The F-4 was closing fast, but when the pilot got within 10 miles of the UFO, all onboard instruments failed. The F-4 retreated and then came in for a second pass. Again, the instruments failed. It was as if an electromagnetic force field was repelling the jet fighter. The pilots never got closer than seven miles before they were forced to retreat. It may suggest a deliberate kind of control mechanism, uh, perhaps from the phenomenon to the airplane system itself, such that when the airplane is no longer a threat, 
it can change the, the radiation or whatever the energy is, whatever the effect is, and so that the systems on board the airplane come back to normal. I put down my phone and I run to my balcony to see if I can see that object. I saw a big star among the other stars, which it was at least twice as large as the normal stars. I asked the tower what happened, and he said he lost the communication again. General Yousefi ordered a second F-4 to engage the UFO. The lead pilot was Iran's number one top gun, Major Hussein Jaffari. It was around 12 miles we lost communication, and I heard nothing from the pilots, so I was so scared what's going to happen and what happened to the pilots. When the F-4 retreated, communication was inexplicably restored. So I asked from the tower controller to tell them to continue their mission and see if they can get more information from the line object. Then, Major Joffrey nervously reported that a smaller UFO had emerged from the larger one and was trying to engage him. And it was coming toward them. They tried to shoot him down. When they squeezed the trigger, it didn't work. And the trigger was inoperative. They couldn't shoot the missiles. The pilots, fearing for their lives, tried to eject. But the eject button jammed. Every backup system was inoperable. We understood that. The eject instrument also does, uh, didn't work. So in this case, I said to God, oh, God save them. The F-4 had no choice but to go into a negative G-force dive to escape this seemingly hostile UFO. When the fighter jet was 10 miles away from the larger UFO, the smaller craft flew off and all onboard communication and instrumentation was restored to the F-4. Major Joffrey reported that the smaller UFO appeared to be landing on a mountaintop just southeast of Tehran. This landing was confirmed on the radar by the control tower. Brigadier General Yousefi witnessed it from his balcony. He went down and landed underground. And now it is a communication between the mother ship and that small flying object and it shows the lights between those two it's connected while they were landing the tower was screaming on the phone to me general this flying object is following them and is going to land in Merabad it's going to, in the, it is in the short final and I see a big big light with the glaring red blue and yellow lights the so-called mothership tailed the F-4 into Mirabad Air Force Base and flew low over the runway. As it performed what was described as a low-altitude flyby, power at the Air Force Base went out. That was strange for us, and we asked each other why the power went out for some seconds. Frankly, I don't have any explanation for that, but I will say that there are other cases well-documented where power has been disrupted on the ground over fairly large areas during UFO presence. After the flyby, the craft roared off toward the west, as if to say, mission accomplished. Search parties were dispatched to the supposed landing site of the smaller UFO, while the tower tried to track the outbound mothership. It was spotted 25 minutes later over the Mediterranean by an Egyptian Air Force pilot. A report sightings was able to confirm with the Egyptian embassy. Then, over Lisbon, Portugal, the pilot, crew, and passengers of a KLM Airlines flight reported seeing the UFO as it sped westward to the Atlantic. That was the last sighting we know of to date. When sightings continues, part two of our UFO investigation, a cover-up went to the highest levels of the Iranian government, and some say Washington knew everything. The American people deserve to know what happened. When the pilots who had encountered a UFO over Tehran returned home, their ordeal was only beginning. They were shocked to see how their UFO confrontation was being distorted and trivialized by a military-controlled press. We knew the capability of the other countries and their airplanes' capabilities. 
It could be a spy airplane. I really have no idea, but maybe from some other world. The day after the otherworldly encounter over Tehran, it was front page news in both the Farsi and English speaking newspapers throughout Iran. At the same time, Iranian and U.S. officials were meeting behind closed doors. This particular case uh, is interesting from another standpoint, and that is the involvement of the American government. General Sabahat, now in exile in California, was the vice commander of the second tactical fighter base. He told sightings that the day after the UFO event, he attended a top secret meeting between the Imperial Iranian Air Force and the U.S. Air Force. General Secord, which was the head of the uh, U.S. Air Force and our Air Force, uh, probably uh, commander, uh, commanding uh, officer and uh, operation, pilot, um, approach control uh, of civil aviation. Hussein Parousi, an air traffic controller at Maribad Air Force Base, was also present at that meeting. When they heard our report and the report of the pilot, they concluded that no country is able to have such a technology. And all of them believed it should be a strange object from other spheres. I collected the reports and I made my own observations as a report to my higher echelon. And we sent this report through the Joint Chiefs of Staff to the Shah's in intention. They collect all of those information and send it to the United States by General Secord uh, because he was the head of the U.S. Air Force in our countries. The secret meetings continued, and rumors of a calculated disinformation program seemed to be borne out by the changing face of Tehran newspaper headlines. Day one. Day two. Day three. Day four. On day five, the press reports the entire incident is a hoax. I don't know why the appropriate authority prohibited me to interview with the press or re uh, news reporter. I don't know why this information is prohibited from the public. Uh, somehow the government doesn't want to uh, open up to the public. I don't know why, but... Despite media dismissals of the event as a joke, our sources report that a full-scale military investigation continued to search for answers. I asked from the pilot of the F-4 to go and to look after that flying object. He knew where it landed. And when they flew and the army personnel, they were in the area, they couldn't see anything. The general who headed that search still lives in Tehran and denied repeated requests for an interview. But others who were present told sightings that no physical evidence of a UFO was found on the mountaintop where so many had reported seeing a small craft landing. However, for the first three days after the incident, there were serious electronic anomalies in the area. The beeping sound that was picked up uh, could be one of a number of things. It might be um, technology. In fact, depending on the frequency stability and interfrequency pulse and other factors like that, uh, it very likely is a technology of some sort, as opposed to a natural phenomenon. And then there is this. An American Defense Systems Program satellite operated by the U.S. Defense Department picked up signals from an unidentifiable technology on the same night the Iranian Air Force was scrambling over Tehran. Experts from DSP are revealing this information for the first time. We saw something. The DSP satellite is, in fact, a spy satellite that monitors airspace in military hotspots. On the night of September 19, 1976, the satellite was scanning the skies over Tehran. Here's the event. That's an independent confirmation that an event of some type occurred at that time and place. What it was, we don't know. Sightings asked the experts to explain the meaning of 238 scans, possible SR, but they told us that information was top secret. Right now, all we can do is say, yes, there was something there. Certain agencies, uh, including the CIA, have gone on record as having information on this particular case. 
In fact, Sightings has obtained these documents from the United States Air Force Security Service that confirm our government's involvement in the UFO investigation. And, according to this Washington Post article, the investigation was still in full force as late as 1979. Now, what does that say? It says that somebody thought this case was very, very important when it happened. Why, after this many years, that's still important? I think is a fundamental question, and the American people deserve to know what happened. Dr. Richard Haynes continues to investigate pilot UFO confrontations as part of his own Project Delta. For the past 30 years, Dr. Haynes has interviewed more than 100 civilian and military pilots who claim to have encountered UFOs. Next, there's a serial killer in the Nevada desert. He does pose as either a security guard or a policeman. She's seen the crime in her mind's eye, and the police are listening. There's a serial killer on the loose somewhere in the West. There have been six, maybe even seven victims already. No one knows where or when the killer will strike again, but sheriffs in Utah, Nevada, and Wyoming don't want to wait until another young woman dies before they find out. They have agreed to our request to let psychic detective Dorothy Allison in on the case. In desolate Elko County, Nevada, two rock collectors found her body. At the time, no one knew that she was just one of many or that it would take a psychic to name her killer. Well, I was notified on uh, November 16th, 1993, that we had a, a body in the desert off of uh, Interstate 80, about 23 miles west of the Utah state line. When we got out there, we found a, uh, a white female, unidentified, completely stripped of all her clothing, jewelry, and had been killed uh, by a gunshot. An enhanced sketch of the victim was released in the hope that a loved one would come forward to claim her. No one did. It's very sad. I, I have a teenage daughter right now, and I would hate for her, something like this to happen to her, and she'd be sitting somewhere and nobody knowing who she is or how she got there. The town of Elko adopted the unknown victim as one of their own. A local mortuary sponsored a funeral for the young woman nobody knew. This young lady had to be somebody's daughter, maybe somebody's wife, somebody's mother. She was due some dignity and respect. The way she died was not very pleasant and we just couldn't in good conscience just take her out and bury her without having some type of a funeral service. Elko could only mourn and wonder why. The victim was buried just as she had been discovered, alone and anonymous. With few clues to go on, Detective Schultz sent out a teletype describing the Elko murder case to law enforcement agencies across the country. Almost immediately, sheriff's detectives in Millard and Juab counties in Utah called in. They both had unsolved murders strikingly similar to the one in Elko. I'll show you where our girl was found. They faced the chilling reality that a killer was on the loose. When all of the investigating detectives met to go over their individual cases, a pattern developed, instantly linking all of the murders. All of the victims were young women, shot with a small caliber weapon and stripped naked. Strangely, their corpses weren't haphazardly dumped. They were placed. The scenes are almost identical. The way their hair was pulled up underneath them, uh, the way their heads were turned, the, the way their hands were laid out in a particular fashion, the way their feet were laid out in a particular fashion. We feel very strongly that the, the bodies were in fact posed, that there are some things that are not natural about the way the bodies uh, were positioned. In all, seven victims in Nevada, Utah, and Wyoming have now been identified as murders that could fit the pattern. We have a, a serial killer, we believe, out there that uh, is, is going to strike again. A killer who has an uncanny knack for finding victims nobody knows and nobody misses. It's very frustrating. You, you start wondering, you know, what else can you do? What can you do? With anonymous victims and few leads, the detectives accepted sightings offer of help. We brought in Dorothy Allison. This 69-year-old New Jersey housewife is also a psychic detective who has worked with the FBI and local law enforcement agencies on over 4,000 murder cases. For Dorothy, the first order of business was to go to the site where the body of Elko's Jane Doe was discovered. The minute that I get near the scene, it, it seems like, I, uh, like the blood is rushing through my body and saying to me, this is what happened to this girl, this is who did it to her, this is what he looks like. 
Things that can help the police out. Her first impressions at the site were about the killer himself. She envisioned the victim's last terrifying moments alone with him. He does pose as either a security guard or a policeman. He does not pose as a trucker that he may be. That's what, what is so shocking to the girls, because they think they were the police officer, and they don't expect this to happen. They're, they're more or less in a state of shock when he starts attacking them. At first, the detectives were skeptical and merely listened politely. But Dorothy quickly gained their undivided attention when she made a series of remarkably accurate statements no one outside of the investigation could know. I was told this girl was shot, and that was all I was told. But I got a feeling about the throat. There's something wrong with the throat, whatever that may be. I don't know. Maybe the police could, you know, sort of let me know what I feel about that throat. Well, the, the only problem I have with that is that has never been released, and, and I, you know, if, I mean, that's a lead for us, and, and there was something, yeah, something was done on all the right, throat. That's all we have. I mean, I don't mind Her accuracy her. made the detectives uneasy, but it also heightened their interest in Dorothy's psychic vision of the killer. I feel that this man stays mostly in the area of Utah and Nevada, although he's been to Portland and a place that's called Castle Rock or something like that. You said something about Castle Rock? Yes. Castledale? Something with castle in it. Any name that has castle in it, he hangs there. Detective Kimball was amazed. Dorothy pinpointed two locations crucial to the victim in his case. The place she was found is on I-70. Uh, out of Castledale. Uh, as I understand it, she was last seen when they did ID in Portland, Oregon. Dorothy spent more than two hours at the site, writing down the flood of impressions she was receiving about the murderer. He sometimes travels with a dog in the car. He likes dogs. Do you, do you see, I mean, is it anything about any oddities about the animals that you see? You mean like one leg off or something? Yeah. We're looking for, for somebody in a vehicle with a three-legged, what we believe is possibly a Rottweiler. Uh, the vehicle was also seen up in this area at about the time of uh, the discovery of this body. Dorothy spent another hour giving the detectives additional clues about the murderer and his possible whereabouts. I believe that he's doing something with checks, some kind of fraud, some kind of robbery from the bank. So since I gave you names, you can check that out. The detectives have asked us not to broadcast those names and many other details provided by Dorothy until they can investigate. Back at the Elko County Sheriff's Office, police sketch artist Janelle Lambert was called in to create a composite of the killer based on Dorothy's visions in the field. So is that long enough right there? Mm -hmm. When the drawing was finished, Detective Kolsch entered the room and was visibly shaken. All right, when uh, we were looking for an individual in a station wagon, that we had a witness here in Elko who had seen this individual. We had taken that individual down to a small police department here within the county who has a forensic police artist and asked him to get a composite of that person. That person drawn is very, very similar in description as that individual right there. That's the guy we're looking for with the dog, the individual with the dog. We asked the once skeptical detectives to evaluate their first experience working with a psychic detective. Uh, to say the least, I think putting a, <clears throat> saying I was skeptical is, is putting it mildly, but Dorothy told us some things today, <clears throat> things that came to her that uh, somewhat take me back, and that's to put that mildly. There were some things that she had said while we were out at the scene that uh, has never been public or made public. Things that were only known by the four of us and or people within our own agency or sheriffs. She gave some names and some businesses and stuff and that I think really need to be followed up on. While the detectives follow up on Dorothy's leads, she continues to provide them with new clues. And for the brutal killer, she has a warning. For the killer, I leave you with this message that I will never give up the rest of my life until you are found. I will help the police in every way I know how, and I'm going to come after you until I get you. Dorothy Allison has provided a number of leads to Utah and Nevada authorities. Among them, a few clues that are so important police have asked us not to reveal them in our story. But they have allowed us to release this composite sketch of the man Dorothy Allison believes is a killer. If you have any information about this case, please contact the Elko County, Nevada Sheriff's Office. 
next, there was a violent entity in this house. MC. Psychic Peter James makes contact when sightings continues. For several months, Sightings has been investigating a stunning paranormal event unfolding in America's heartland. A young family is being plagued by ghostly activity that ranges from the innocuous to the bizarre, and it won't go away. We called in renowned psychic Peter James to see if he could communicate with the entity and make the haunting activity stop. Psychic Peter James says he has had the ability to communicate with ghosts since he was a child. Today, Peter continues to develop his power to speak with and even see what he believes are the spirits of the dead. Well, the first thing I look for is, is to visually see if there are any ghosts that roam the area. And if they're there, then uh, they generally make it known or make their presence known. And these entities do communicate with me. Now, Sightings has brought Peter James into America's heartland to investigate haunting activity we've been following for several months. Peter James never saw any videotape. He knew nothing specific about the haunting or its gruesome effects. The identity of the family was not disclosed to Peter. The husband is also asked to have his identity hidden on our tapes. A sightings video crew accompanied Peter to the family's 100-year-old house. Before he even stepped inside, Peter saw something. You know what I sense up there? I got just a glimpse of that upper window of the face of a little girl. And I don't know who lives here. It's a boy, right? But I saw the face of a little girl in that window just now. A little girl is precisely what the husband described seeing months before. I walked over to the kitchen cabinet, opened the cabinet, and got out a glass, poured more orange juice. Started to take a drink, and as I turned around, there was a little girl standing not more than three foot away from me, He's just as plain as you are to me now. Peter never heard this interview. He never saw the sketch. And he didn't know the family called the spirit Sally. There's a little girl that's standing right there, right at the top of the stairs. Hello? Hello? Look, look. Hello? Can you speak to me? Sally? Is that your name, Sally? Sally? Okay. The family and our sightings investigative team were amazed that Peter James had correctly named the entity. But even more startling was an interview that sightings conducted later that same day. A former resident of the house revealed that she had also heard about someone named Sally, but at the time she thought it was just a figment of her daughter's imagination. I lived here about three years ago with my three children, and uh, we lived here for about eight months. And the whole time we lived here, my uh, daughter was five at the time. She had an imaginary friend named Sally. I'd, I'd scold Heather. I would scold her for something, and she would come back and tell me, I didn't do that, Sally did it, or Sally told me to do it. But the former tenants' encounters with Sally were harmless compared to what happened when this family moved in. I can, t I can tell that uh, you're, you're losing your breath right now. Without warning, scratches on the husband's body would begin to welt and bleed as our cameras rolled. The mission on this visit was to give Peter James a chance to try to communicate with whoever or whatever was plaguing the family. Would he succeed where parapsychologists had failed? I'm getting a lot of resistance right here at the door, meaning whatever is in the room wants me out. Speak to me. Peter had no prior knowledge about the scratching and bleeding phenomena attributed to Sally. So when the husband began to panic during this session, Peter thought it was just nerves. Really, just now? <clears throat> when you said, speak to me now, yeah. he felt the cold yeah. fly past him. And, and she scratched you? There. I'm my back's been stinging. <laughs> are, you, are you okay? Yeah, I just... Don't, don't be frightened. There's nothing to be afraid of. Remember, <clears throat> remember you're, you're, you're in control here, so don't... don't... MC. Wow. 
Who? I heard they had electrical shock. Yes, let me just, right here, right here, right in my hand. Did you hear that? Get right in my hand. It hit me right there. Hello? Easy. I'm not afraid of you. Was the electrical shock a form of communication? And was the MC a cryptic message from a tortured spirit? Peter James believes that the initials are evidence of more than one ghost in this house. I do feel as we speak that over the years that at least three people died in this house. She, she tells me that there was something with her, with her lungs, with her breathing, and also that she hurt her foot or her Sightings search ankle. town records for evidence supporting Peter James's psychic visions. In the Hall of Records, we found this, the death record of a child named Sally, date of death, 1905. We also tried to substantiate this vision. <clears throat> um, do you know if anyone medical lived in this house? There, were, there was a medical person? Yeah, because that's I feel very medical about this for some reason. In a city directory printed in 1903, sightings discovered that the person living in the house at the time was indeed a physician. And according to city records, he moved out in 1906, just after the death of Sally. Was there a connection? During our investigation, Peter James was drawn to the graveyard, one of the oldest in the town. It was here that he had a vision of a little girl dying of pneumonia and the doctor who couldn't save her. As he wandered among the headstones, Peter James described a small voice calling him toward one particular grave. Here, he felt an overwhelming grief. Here, he said, lay Sally. But the marker was so old and weather-worn, the lettering had disappeared. But when sightings checked the cemetery's records, we discovered that plot one, fourth row west, was the final resting place of Sally Isabel Hall. Peter James's visit has helped the family understand a little bit more about what may be causing the haunting in their house. But Peter has not been able to stop the scratching and bleeding and terror that is now part of the family's daily routine. Later in our program, details about a new expanded investigation that sightings is mounting. Next, a mysterious bond between animals and humans is saving lives. Then, an angry spirit leaves a bloody trail when our Heartland Ghost investigation continues. Medical science can work miracles. Advances in laser technology and microsurgery are giving life to people who just 10 years ago might not have made it. But technology isn't a cure-all. For people with severe head injuries, the newest therapy method doesn't depend on high-tech machinery. It allows the unconditional love of pets to work miracles. It's a mysterious strength that, that I don't understand. I wouldn't presume to uh, try to explain, either in my setting as, as a doctor or in uh, a layman's setting with their own pet at home. In 2,500 hospitals and rehabilitation centers around the country, animal-assisted therapy is becoming an accepted part of a trauma patient's daily routine. When the program started 15 years ago, doctors and nurses were suspicious. But now, it's hard to argue with the results. It really confirms what I believe, that there is that special human-animal bond, and if we can link into that and utilize that to promote a patient's progress, it'll be a wonderful thing. That's true. At the Tyler Rehabilitation Center in Texas, more than 80 dogs and their owners are involved in the animal-assisted therapy program. Can you open your mouth more when you're talking? It's like, this is not happening, you know because there was no smiles, no, no reaction. Bobby Gossett's vibrant smile and his career as a trucker ended when Bobby had a massive stroke. There was like nothing. He might like look at you, but it was like space, you know. There was nothing there. But then when he saw the animal, it was just like totally different. It's weird. It was like tears of joy. That's the best way because you could see him coming back, that you had nothing before. This videotape demonstrates the successful bonding that occurs between animal and human during animal-assisted therapy. At first, Bobby Gossett was unresponsive to traditional therapy for stroke patients. But only 20 minutes later, with the help of one dog, 
Bobby was a changed man. Bobby Gossett is back home now with his wife and his own dogs. The progress he's made has far exceeded his doctor's expectations. The Gossets give much of the credit to animal-assisted therapy. We never thought he'd come this far. We had no hopes of it. I wasn't sure that he'd ever walk, because he couldn't walk. He, well, he couldn't even sit up when we first started. We had to come a long, long way. For stroke patients um, that may have had problems with speaking, we might have them working on naming body parts or giving the dog commands so that they can practice their speech. Head injury patients, we might work on tracking or focusing as they're coming out of a coma. Spinal cord patients might work on a variety of different balance activities, like throwing the ball. And... All right. Good girl. The dogs give me a sense of happiness and I know that they're working with me as well as me working with them, and it just makes me feel good. We thought she'd die. We did. We, we thought truly she... thought she would die. We thought she was too sick to get better. She had so many, so many things stacked against her. But Kirsten Sender didn't die, despite the fact that she was crushed inside this van, submerged in a muddy creek. She'd inhaled all that water, she had pneumonia, she had a concussion, she had multiple broken bones. The woman who strokes this greyhound today entered the center completely paralyzed. The muscles that now throw a ball for a game of fetch were once badly atrophied. I don't know what's happening uh, there. I'm, I don't think anyone knows specifically what's going on among the neurons in the brain that allow that breakthrough. Well, I have never really been an emotional man, but I have become one. <laughs> in the last uh, four weeks, five weeks. I mean, uh, watching my daughter today flex her fingers was very, very emotional. Yeah. Got it. Come on, a little more. Lift up your fingers. There you go. There we go. And a deep breath. Feel all those bones. Feel them. The animal volunteers come in every size, shape, and breed. But not every dog is right for the program. The key is temperament, not training. The dog has to be comfortable with a stranger, you know, manipulating them and touching them and rubbing them and, and all sorts of things that they do that's going to happen in therapy. Um, we do react, see how they react to wheelchairs for the first time if they've never seen them. We evaluate how they react with, um, like, a pan dropping. How do they react if they're startled? And, like human volunteers, the dogs seem to thrive when they're helping others. When I acquired her, she was absolutely unsocialized. She still uh, has a great deal of energy, but when she works, she's really uh, into her job. The minute she gets onto the table, uh, you can almost see her little brain click. It's very, very serious business to her. While science tries to figure out why, the animals continue to restore lives and families. Her prognosis was dim, and they didn't know that with her injuries, if that she would ever be able to respond to the messages that were coming from her brain. In 1993, Stacy Paul was a high school track star, member of the drill team, a loving daughter and sister. Then there was a car crash. Well, the outlook was bleak, it wasn't good. They, in fact, they didn't think that she'd make it through the initial nine and they were in an automobile accident on the way to school, and I say they because her 13-year-old sister was with her and she was killed instantly in that same accident. Stacy was in a deep coma. Doctors prepared her parents for the worst and gave them little hope for the best. Even when Stacy came out of her coma, she was unable to walk or talk. Stacy had the whole realm of therapy. When she started going to Sherry in pet therapy, she couldn't even control her head. She's been bright-eyed all morning. The progress is so gradual, people think that you wake up and go, oh, I've been in coma, I'm really glad to be here. But it's like an evolution, it's like you evolve from that infantile state again. At first, Stacy was strapped in a wheelchair, unable to speak. But through a power no one fully understands, this was Stacy less than six months later. And now she's, you know, up walking around and she looks great and she's, she's got a job and she's doing wonderfully. You know, from what we were told originally, the fact the, the recovery she's made, it is a mir miracle. And I'll never forget that feeling when that last football game, when she walked across the football field with the mascots on each side and she got a standing ovation. I'm going to have kids and like, and then I'm going to, you know, live on a farm. Stacy Paul, daughter of Mike and Linda Paul. 
animal therapy works. Is it unconditional love, the touch of soft fur against a frail hand, or is it a deeper connection that heals the spirit first and then the body? It's intangible at the present time. In the future, as we understand the workings of the brain and human body uh, more, perhaps we'll figure out some, some explainable connection. Stacy Paul continues to improve. Although she has a long way to go, Stacy and her family are filled with hope for the future because she's come so far already, thanks in large part to a friend named Sophie. Next, our Heartland ghost investigation continues and a violent spirit tries to communicate. There is an element of danger here and we should take it very seriously. Sought the advice and expertise of the world's leading parapsychologist, Carrie Gaynor. He analyzed our early field tapes, and now, with the growing incidents in the house, Kerry Gaynor himself is traveling to the site. We brought in electronic specialists and over half a million dollars in monitoring equipment that we hoped might pick up any physical manifestations of paranormal activity. Remote-controlled cameras were strategically placed in areas of the home where the presence of an entity had been reported previously by the family and our crew. Okay, now let's just try to focus. The front focus. Frequency counters and oscilloscopes were set to monitor any electronic interference. A thermal imaging system was brought in to record any measurable changes in temperature. The camera sees only degrees of hot and cold producing these eerie images showing red where the temperature is higher, blue where it is cooler. The hope was that this thermal system would provide a visual record of ghostly cold spots. While the monitoring systems were put in place, Carrie Gaynor worked with the family and other eyewitnesses to develop a game plan for his field investigation. During the last 20 years, I've investigated about 850 cases, and during that time, I have never come across anything like this. Sightings monitored every part of the house for 24 consecutive hours, while Carrie Gaynor kept vigil with the family by candlelight, and still, the entity was not deterred. During that time, I witnessed 11 separate attacks in the form of scratch marks on Jeff. You, you can see that. Could you please let us know you're here? My arm is numb. Yeah. Our full investigation of the Heartland Ghost next time on Sightings. If you've had a paranormal experience, call the Sightings Hotline at 1-900-933-SIGHT. That's 1-900-933-7444. Each call 65 cents a minute. Average call lasts three minutes. Sightings is also online. Our email address is sightings at aol.com. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Next on Sci-Fi, The Sentinel. On the next Invisible Man. My brother. Darian thought his brother was gone. Your brother's dead. You can't prove that. Dead and buried. What a surprise, huh? It can't be. And the cure for invisibility along with him. Tell me the truth, Batman. He was dead wrong. You think you saw him? Kevin! I saw him. Hello, brother. The Invisible Man, a Sci-Fi original series. Disappearing tonight at 8 on Sci-Fi.